Your plans? Today it's dinner with the parents at your spot. We gotta come back here. Now, their spot. Or you're on the edge of your seat at the game. Come on, just one time. And it's the one. <gasps> or maybe you're catching the next flight to... Now boarding flight 1850. Oh, that's you. The choice is yours. And when you're with Amex, it's not if it's going to happen, but when. American Express. Don't live life without it. Other banks go out of their way to make redeeming credit card rewards needlessly complicated. Like how they require minimums or force you to use your rewards before reaching some arbitrary expiration date. But Discover isn't like that. With Discover, you can redeem your rewards for cash in any amount at any time. So you'll never have to jump through hoops. Unless you're like a trapezist, then by all means, go right ahead. Learn more at discover.com slash redeem rewards. Terms apply. Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and you're not listening to Revive Thoughts. Uh, Although this will show up in the Revive Thoughts feed, this is actually a Revive Thoughts deep dive part one. We are incredibly overdue for this. Uh, This took a long, (laughs) long time to create. If you have been a listener a long time, you probably remember the last time we had a deep dive was Joan of Arc. And before that, you would know there was the First Crusade, and before that was the Salem Witch Trials. Now, this episode, I can only tell you, was so delayed because I moved to Cambodia and then Indonesia. But but also, um, this episode is incredibly delayed because it... It is, it is one of the toughest subjects. I, it, no, it is without a doubt the toughest subject I've ever had to study in church history since we started Revive Thoughts. This has been an idea I have had uh, since very early on. I'll discuss that in just a minute. But it took so long to figure out and be able to give you answers that I feel confident with like 75% confidence because that's as high as I can be confident on anything. 75, in the that's good. I'll, yeah, that I, is like, I, if I, I guess I, I'll if take I, that. If I hit 75, that is a sure fight. That is like practically as written in stone as you can get about this subject. We're going to talk about it. Now, if you're listening to this, this is going to be called part one. Usually we do deep dives. It's like three hours of content. But I knew if we did that, Joel would have to edit it. And you'd be getting this deep dive in like Christmas of 2025. So I wanted this to be coming to you a little bit quicker in a part one, part two, part maybe part three. Uh, sequence and if you want to listen to all the parts you will have to join us on patreon you can get the first part and we're hoping that will entice you to want to hear the full story of the church of ethiopia and what's going on there and what you know this (laughs) if you've listened to deep dives before if you have not i apologize but if you've listened to deep dives before you'll know that i almost always say something like well to find out what happened we have to go back and and like if the subject is the salem with trials in 1600s i'm like so in 1472 (laughs) <laughs> this one is so much worse than any others because to tell you the story that I originally set out to tell, which happens in the 1300s, I have to go all the way back to 1000 BC. So I, we literally are telling you the entire history of the story of Ethiopia. Now, some of you might be listening to this and going, well, why would I want to hear that? I am not interested in this country's origins. Well, there's three big, que- three, three to like 10 big questions we go through. And I'm just going to hit you with one of the first ones. This is the question that got me interested in the story of Ethiopia. Now, I was always interested in it, but this is the one that made me go, wait a second, I need to do research. I remember I was sitting at a diner in Kansas City, and I was telling a friend about Revive Thoughts. This was three years ago, almost to like this day, like it was in July. And I was telling them all these exciting things I was learning about John Calvin, you know, Martin Luther, all these great people in church history. I was really, you know, hammering the Reformation. So I was learning so much of this cool stuff from history. And my friend was like, yeah, but didn't all these guys just steal that from the Ethiopian church? And I was like, I, I didn't see that in any of my research. He's like, yeah, I mean, all of the Reformation was done in the Church of Ethiopia. They just stole it, and they did it in Europe, and everyone knows that. And Martin Luther even met with an Ethiopian deacon, um, and so it's pretty much just, it was just stolen. And if you're hearing that and you're like me, you're like, I did not know that. Uh, well, we're going to answer that question for you. Did hmm. the Reformers steal the Reformation from the Church of Ethiopia? And that got me really thinking 
and we do research. We will give you that answer, but we won't give it to you just yet. We're going to make you listen. Uh, because the answer is is slightly more complex than it might sound on paper. And it, it is actually, in some ways, both... We will get there. But secondly, that gave me pause to a question I have always wanted to know, which is, what happened in Ethiopia? Because if you go to the book of Acts, the Ethiopian church, like Ethiopia is mentioned in the book of Acts, both when Pentecost happens, they specifically mention Ethiopian believers are there. So Africa is getting mentioned here. But also, there is an Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts that is a, is a worth an entire story. And I'm going to read that to you because this is, I mean, the true beginning of the uh, story. But also, we'll, we'll get there in a second. But what happens here in this book of Acts, this huge thing that occurs, and then the rest of the story of Acts doesn't go into any more details of what happens. And you're just kind of left with this weird moment. So let me read this for you, not criticizing how the Bible put it, but just let me read this to you because it's kind of a mystery. Okay, so if you go in your Bibles to Acts chapter 8, verse 26, you'll see this story, and you're probably familiar with it, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. An angel from the Lord spoke to Philip at noon, take the road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he did. Meanwhile, an Ethiopian man was on his way home from Jerusalem, where he had come to worship. He was a eunuch and an official responsible for the entire treasury of Candace. Candace is the title given to the Ethiopian queen. He was reading that the, he was reading the prophet Isaiah while sitting in his carriage. The spirit told Philip, approach his carriage and stay with it. Running up to the carriage, Philip heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you really understand what you are reading? And the man replied, without someone to guide me, how could I? Then he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This was the passage of scripture he was reading. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, before its shearer is silent, so he didn't open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was taken away from him. Who can tell the story of his descendants? Because his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, about whom does the prophet say this? Is he talking about himself or someone else? Starting... And starting with that passage, Philip proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him. As they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, Look, water, what should keep me from being baptized? He ordered that the carriage halt. Both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, where Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Lord's Spirit suddenly took Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip found himself in Azadus. He traveled through that area, preaching the good news in all the cities until he reached Caesarea. So here, this incredible moment, Philip is being told by the Holy Spirit, go in this direction. He meets this gentleman. You know, this is one of the most famous uh, passages for evangelism. Uh, this is an incredible, it is a very common passage. I mean, there's so much goodness happening here. And, and yet, Joel, what happens next in Ethiopia? That's, that's the big question, right? What, what happened to the Church of Ethiopia? We see it pop up, pockets through history. Eventually, it seems like it putters out a bit and that's what we're diving into today and we're we're doing a little bit of a different format on this deep dive uh troy has been relentless relentlessly researching and becoming the best expert in the world at the church of ethiopia i have not been doing that <laughs> I've been sitting here wondering uh, what's taking Troy so long to, to do all this research, <laughs> to juggle all this stuff. But here we are. We're going to do a bit of a, a Q&A type thing where I am asking questions and Troy is answering these questions because he's the expert on this now. I am not the expert on this. I purposely have kept myself in the dark regarding the Church of Ethiopia as to be a better audience surrogate for uh, hopefully a lot of our li I'm sure we have a lot of listeners that are uh, pretty well versed in the Church of Ethiopia. I'm not one of them. I am pretty vague. I know I so I know the passage you just read, Troy. Um I know, you know, they they get going around like 300 AD out there doing their thing yeah. in Africa. They uh again be uh, show up pockets throughout history are kind of i feel like regarded as like a proto reformation like kind of like a pre they kind of kind of a a, a break off secluded doing a, a similar reformation type thing in africa uh, but again eventually all dying out and honestly that's where my what i've heard <laughs> that, that's that's kind of all i know that's where it stops and granted i probably i probably should know more about the ethiopian church but the reality of the situation is I do not, and I'm excited. I'm excited to learn today, and I'm all set up here. I got 
I got a plate, so it's morning here for me. <laughs> so I got a plate with some quiche on it that I'm. That's my my breakfast. I got drinks, various drinks. I have a uh, a cherry limeade, a uh, bubbly water. I got a big uh, water thermos here. It's very important to stay hydrated. I'm a very big advocate of staying hydrated. I'm reclined here in my. Not me. Office. I'm an advocate of dehydration. Let me tell you, we That'll we are so soft with our two cups of water a day. We need to get down to four mm. drops and nothing no, else. No, 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 no. <laughs> that is that is ill advice. Do not take that advice. Uh, I'm comfortable. I'm relaxed. I'm like reclined here. I got my microphone set up, so I'm just I'm I'm ready to to po- poke holes in your stories and Please <laughs> ask questions. Uh, let no stone go unturned uh, as we explore the world of the Church of Ethiopia. Because I, I also, I mean, there's some controversy around it too, right? There's people yeah. that uh, are very much not about the Church of Ethiopia or discredit them or disregard them entirely, and I'm not entirely sure why. Uh, but well, we'll I'm curious, talk about it. We I'm curious to that. hear what you uh, what you have to say about that. But uh, where should we start, Troy? Well, for starters, let me start with the chapter in Acts. So this is actually really interesting to me, and this is all this is something I noticed that almost immediately when I began, like start if when I was like, okay, I'm gonna start with Acts and go from there. Well, if you notice in this chapter, chapter eight of Acts happens. The Ethiopian eunuch is baptized. Chapter nine, Peter gets his vision, and in chapter ten, I believe, he goes to Cornelius. And hmm. it gets them all baptized. Well, wait a second. Hmm. If Cornelius is considered the first Gentile to be baptized and given the Holy Spirit, well, why wasn't the Ethiopian eunuch considered a Gentile? If we're considering the idea that Acts is for the most part chronological, I've never had anybody argue that it's not, or that somebody, how they would pick up a Gentile passage and put it before Peter's vision for some unknown reason, If that's not what's going on here, well, why isn't the Ethiopian eunuch considered the first Gentile, right? Is Gentile only mean Greek? It's supposed to mean anyone kind of like not Jewish. Or why would the Ethiopians get a pass on this, right? That alone stood out to me as like, wait a second, there's something interesting here. And I'll give you a couple different... There's one frustrating part about this entire story is there's no one correct answer and there's no one correct interpretation we just don't know uh, enough about what happened the records in ethiopia were not always kept and the answers were not always done as well there's a couple different reasons one is sometimes people will use this passage and say well the ethiopian eunuch was a proselyte he was a he was a jewish believer maybe he was circumcised all the different things you would need to be a jewish believer but he was not, um, you know, so he was one of those kind of people, right? He was a Gentile, but considered Jewish. However, I'm not sure why Cornelius, maybe he wasn't circumcised, but why he wouldn't fall under that same category. And I don't know that there's anything in the text to tell us that the Ethiopian eunuch was more Jewish than, um, than Cornelius was, other than the fact that, look, he seemed to be going to Jerusalem and he had a scroll of Isaiah. So he must have at some level been considered Jewish. Now, there's a second answer, and that is for a very, very, very long time, and this is going to come up multiple times throughout this deep dive because it actually is very important to the story, there is a large number of Jewish people living in Ethiopia. Even today, the nation state of Israel allows some people from Ethiopia to come in and get Israeli status because they are considered among the lost tribes or among the lost people in the nations, um, and genetically, they are considered Israelite. Now, that's today. Back then, there were even more. So it's perhaps possible that the Ethiopian eunuch was one of those. One of the people who, if you saw him, you would have known he was Jewish, even though he was an Ethiopian eunuch. And that <clears throat> at different times, uh, some scholars, I think this might be overblown, but some would even say that the population of Ethiopia was as high as one third Jewish. Um, I think that's probably pretty high, but that could explain why that wasn't considered you know, when we say Ethiopian, we think someone from Africa. When they said Ethiopian and Israel, they might have thought, oh, yeah, that's probably just one of our Israelite, you know, brothers who lives in Ethiopia who, you know, has been disconnected from us for a time. But look, he's still coming to Jerusalem. He's cl- that would have been clear to them in a contextual way that is not clear to us. And so those are two possible answers to the question as to why do you think? What do you think? What, what's, your, what's your money on? What do you think it is? You, to, you know, to be honest, this is a 50-50 flipper. I don't know. I, I did a ton of research on this. And the problem is when you do research on like, hey, are these people a part of the Lost Tribes? Boy, let me tell you, you, you Google lot, what happens to the Lost Tribes of Israel and you will 
uh, end up swept away in a vortex where everybody is a part of the law. The Eskimos, the North Americans, Japan, Malaysia, China, everybody, the, the Huns, the Mongolians, the, everybody is uh, Britain, it's Scotland. Everyone's a part of the Lost Tribes of Israel. If you if you go down that road, and who knows, right? The ten tribes were lost. Maybe I don't, but you know, probably not, right? But, but you're, Ethiopia. you're essentially saying the same thing, right? You're saying that he wasn't seen as a Gentile because he was he was yes. recognized as Jewish for one Possibly. reason or another. Possibly, which I think is very interesting because if you read that passage today, did you automatically assume? Yeah, well, of course not. He's Jewish, right? I wouldn't have assumed that. That was something that was lost on me. And so already you can see that Ethiopia is more complex and a little bit differently situated than Rome. And the fact that no Roman citizen, with the Mm. exception of Paul, I guess, but no Roman, you would automatically assume that they were Jewish. That was something they would have had to tell you. But with the Ethiopians, maybe it was that they were already considered Jewish, or maybe this guy was a proselyte and it was pretty obvious he was. I'm not, and, and that's another thing too. How did a eunuch even get into Jerusalem? Because technically they weren't even, I'm pretty sure, allowed in the temple at that time. Yet he's going home with a scroll from Isaiah. There are questions of what's going on exactly here that go a little bit beyond the scope. But the Ethiopian eunuch heads off in a chariot. And as a kid in Sunday school, I remember that this was like, and he, and, and, and the kind of the Sunday school teacher goes, and to this day, there's an Ethiopian kingdom that's Christian. I was like, wow. And it sounds like the Ethiopian eunuch goes and starts that kingdom. And that would be false. That's not what happened. That that did not occur. Although there were Christians in Ethiopia, like there were Christians in pretty much every part of the ancient world, the church as a like real body of believers did not get started under the eunuch. In fact, it did not get started either under Matthew, who is famous, you know, the church history story goes that Matthew went to Ethiopia and was speared to death. Now, the Ethiopian church goes, hey, we never killed an apostle. We, he was fine here. We all liked him. But they also say that Matthew did not start the church of Ethiopia. Everyone agrees that the church of Ethiopia does not start until the year around 300 A.D., Before we go to that, there's one more. I mean, I know you're hearing like, okay, there's so many things I have to keep in mind with Ethiopia. I know it's a lot, but there's one more thing that you may have heard from Ethiopia. And you may have heard this just in casual talk or legends, but it's really important to the story. And that goes all the way back to the year 1000 BC. Joel, who is important in the year 1000 BC? Do you remember? No, in the year 1000 BC... Solomon, correct. Yeah, you got it, man. The son of David. So Solomon, the wisest man on earth, is reigning. And famously, a queen of Sheba, which Sheba was considered the land of Demot, which is the former land, the land that comes, that we'll get to in a second, uh, is Ethiopia as well, basically, comes up and she goes to meet with Solomon, right? And she is astounded by his wisdom. And that's a beautiful story. It's in the, it's in the, it's in, um, you know, the, the Old Testament is one of the many things that we see. However, we know that story to be she was astounded by his wisdom and she goes home and is like, wow, that Solomon is everything uh, we thought he was. The Ethiopian church, and we'll get to how they get to this part, but they uh, they know it a little bit differently. The people of Demot and the people of Ethiopia came up with a slightly different version. Uh, and maybe it happened. I'm going to say it probably didn't. But maybe it didn't. And maybe it did. This is their way of saying what happened, which is the Queen of Sheba was astounded by his wisdom and said, you know, And Solomon said, hey, I like you, Queen of Sheba, too. Whatever you want, I will give you. And she said, I want a son that he may be wise like you. And so he said, I will give you a son. He, um, the two of them, you know, do the things that need to occur. And she goes home pregnant with a son. And she gives birth to the son, the son of Solomon. And then this son of Solomon goes back to Solomon, gets like trained under Solomon, comes back and begins the former, the the official dynastic line of kings in Ethiopia. Have you ever heard of any of this before? Is this is this something you're familiar no, with, Joel? I, I, no, this is all off my radar. Oh, man. This is really important to Ethiopian, like, this whole movement. Because this, for you know, if you've ever seen Lord of the Rings, um, or if your worldly friends have ever told you about Game of Thrones... Oh, pardon me, my daughter is here. Okay, can you go to Mama and show me your cup of water? Okay, sweetie. That was adorable. Yeah. She's super cute when she's half asleep. <laughs> so right. we have the, the line of kings that came yes. from Solomon and uh, what, what, what's this queen again? Queen of Sheba. And she's, Queen of you know, Sheba. They, Queen of Sheba goes back to Ethiopia, yeah. has a, a bloodline that that all of these kings are being established yeah. on. 
Uh, it's it's yeah. It's like if you've ever seen Lord of the Rings. If you uh, if you know, kind of being a nerd here, but you know, it's fine. You're, you're, you remember Aragorn is like the son of son of son of so and so. He's supposed to be the king over Gondor. And if I recall, it's been like thousands of years at this point since Gondor has had a king. But because Aragorn is the son of whoever the king was supposed to be, he's still the guy that runs the show. And it's very similar. Like if you've ever heard of Game of Thrones, they have a very similar thing. Whoever's supposed to be on the throne, whatever, there's this bloodline idea. There's a lineage, yeah. Yes, and that becomes so important to the people in this region of who's going to rule them. And it will come up at least a couple times where like the Solomon, the, the people of Solomon are kind of coming in to take over things. So the Queen of Sheba comes back to Ethiopia. This is around the year 1000 BC. And she's a real person. Jesus even says that the Queen of Sheba had seen what she, you know, me in my day. You know, so, they, so he's acknowledging her as real. She goes back to Ethiopia. At the time, that time, Ethiopia's not called Ethiopia. In fact, Ethiopia won't be called Ethiopia until like 1800. It's called, um, at this time, the Damat people. The Damat people run this area of Africa. Uh, and then over time, they get replaced by this new group called the Aksum people. The Aksum people are the people we're looking at right here when the Ethiopian eunuch shows up. That's whose court he's kind of running. They'll run part of Africa, and they'll also run part of the Middle East. So they're kind of over by Saudi Arabia and Yemen, kind of like that little part. And then there's, you know, that water, and then there's the African side. And that's Ethiopia as the Aksum Empire. And look, you probably don't know much about the Axum Empire. I did not know much about the Axum Empire, but they were a really, really big deal in their time. And you may say, okay, yeah, but everyone says everyone was a big deal. Well, they were, though. The Persians said there are four great empires in the world. There's us, and of course, they're going to put themselves in there, right? There's the Romans, there's the Chinese, and there's the Axum Empire. They're saying that this empire is on, you know, is on par with the four greatest kingdoms, you know, in some ways that you could say of the ancient world, right? for sure most people would agree that the chinese kingdom the roman kingdom and the persians were their big deal so why don't we remember the axum empire what what on earth like how did this big group escape our notice and the main thing that seems to have happened is just they didn't keep good records and the the, the paper and the materials that you would use to write down your legends your stories or whatever it is you're doing just didn't survive very very well in africa you know this is pretty hot part of the world this is you know no one thinks egypt is a cool vacation and yet we're talking you know like a thousand miles lower than egypt here it's very hot it's very tropical it's very and then just the conditions were not right for most of their records to be caught in fact the damat people we have almost no records of their existence except for kind of what was kept track by the by the axon people just saying like when we took over their lands basically so it's very hard to know exactly what was happening and what was going on and it's kind of sad because this was a big kingdom that lasted i mean it started around 500 bc they started beginning taking over lands in 500 bc they will go on till i think the year 900 a.d and yet that's 1500 years i mean that's a long time for an empire and yeah, we only really have just a scintilla. I mean, just a little bit of their entire kingdom. <laughs> it's sad. And the thing we compare that to the Roman Empire, they're, you know, from their height to their fall, that's about a thousand years, give or take. But we have a ton of information on the Romans, just a ton. The Axumite people, it's just not as much. You know, you're having to work with just a lot, lot less. And that's part and just of to what to clarify, the, the, yeah. the Axum are, is Ethiopia. Yes, so Ethiopia, before it's called Ethiopia, is called the Axum. Axum when, when did it start getting called Ethiopia? I think it gets started calling it Ethiopia like in the 17 and 1800s. So it's it's okay. way later. It well, might have been 15 or 1600s, late. but it's not it's not its original name. And you might have also heard it as the Abyssinia Kingdom too. That was another name that it had at one point. It has a few different names. All of these are the same place or the same region. And that's the other thing about Ethiopia too. What we think of as Ethiopia is like this country in Africa, and that is correct. But also, again, this would have uncovered part of the Middle East and not all of the car part of the country of Ethiopia today. It's kind of moved over over time. Um, and so, so that's the region. So so if we're looking at the original manuscripts of Acts, you know, translating it, 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 it's, it's not translated Ethiopia in Yeah. They would have Greek. used probably, I imagine, I haven't looked at it in Greek, but they would have used their name, which would have been Axum, or at least whatever the Greek name for the Axumite people that they were calling them I was. See. Okay. So okay. you got this kingdom, you got them, they, they get the eunuch, they get Matthew the Apostle from everyone except for their account, they kill Matthew the Apostle, and for 200 years, things are quiet. So what wait, changes? Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. So, 
uh, ch- church tradition says that Matthew got killed there. They're claiming they didn't kill Matthew? Yeah, their claim is like, whoa, we would never kill an apostle. Um, so you know, where do we get that? Where do we get that account from? From everyone else. I know, I know else. that's that's off topic, but yeah, <laughs> that one just comes from everyone else. The Catholic, the 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 entire world, you know, from because we because look, when it comes to everyone, we say the apostles were killed. We don't know. I mean, that's not scripture, mm-hmm. right? It's not inspired by God. That is the story and the legend, and there's plenty of evidence to believe it because there are plenty of like outer lying accounts where people are kind of saying, yeah, that seems to be what happened to the apostles. In the case of Matthew, it was every, all the evidence points that he went to Ethiopia and died. But the Ethiopian church says, "I don't." Just from what I can tell, this doesn't want to say they killed an apostle, and so it's just like, "No, we didn't do that. You can't prove it." And there's other cases too. I remember the Spanish church. Um, I met a gentleman who was a missionary to Spain, and he said, "Look, we didn't kill. You know, or, or, sorry, he was like, we did, Paul came here. He preached here. We have his footsteps and all this stuff. There's all this evidence that Paul went to Spain and got out of Rome. It was fine." But most people believe Paul was killed in Rome, and that he never made it to Spain. But the Spanish, you know, at least this gentleman and some people in Spain are claiming that Paul did make it to Spain, and that that's a lie that he right. died in Rome, and that he made it to his goal. In very much the same way, we can't tell who's telling the truth, but 99% of us are pretty sure Paul died in Rome. In the same way, we don't know. I guess it's possible Matthew had a great time in Ethiopia, but 99% of us are pretty sure he didn't make it. You know, it, it, he got killed right. in Ethiopia. Okay. Okay. So, so, yeah, so Matthew gets killed, and then we don't hear anything about the Church of Ethiopia until 300, or like uh, probably about 200 years after that or so. Yeah, that's that's the correct. In the so year 300 when, AD. Yep. So the story of the Church of Ethiopia kicks, kicked off with a gentleman named Frumentius. Frumentius is a, a very young man when this story gets started, actually. He is uh, uh, the son, or no, he's, sorry, he's, he's the nephew of... Of hold, this on, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, sorry, I'm sorry. I just want to go back to Matthew one more time. I still yeah, don't fully understand. So, so this eunuch supposedly goes back, and there's there's yeah. believers there in Ethiopia, and Matthew comes to to check in on him. Like, what's he doing there in the first? I think Matthew I know. I know. Again, heading, this is just church tradition. Yeah. Like, we're we're speculating, but well, so and that's the thing. So there are two different church traditions, and you you know you're depending on your. There, so there are some people who say Paul went only to the Gentiles. The other eleven apostles stayed and preached in Israel, and that's where they stayed. But the more popular, and I think the more common church tradition is no. The disciples went off in different directions. If I recall, it was Thomas who went to India. Um, mm-hmm. Matthew and so Matthew is going to Ethiopia. They're trying to go to the, you know the corners of the earth. Uh, maybe they did stay in church that preach in Israel for a while, but they're going to their different locations to plant the different churches. And Matthew's place to go was uh, Ethiopia. And again, most of them don't survive. You know, they don't. They all die in different ways uh, through this process. And that's how uh, how I have heard it, and know it. That's how I think most of us know it. But again, right. there are some people who think they never did leave Israel that they stayed. But if you believe that they left and that they went and died on the mission field, this is where Matthew would have been. But but if there's believers there, you're saying that they they thought it was it's so no he's killed by the Ethiopians like if okay. there are believers he's not killed by the yeah, Ethiopian no, no, church no. there person no the Ethiopian church just didn't like the idea that Ethiopians killed an apostle not that okay. the Ethiopian church did. thank you for clarifying yeah that's a good one okay. So we go forward 200 years to the man named Frumentius. He is the nephew of a Christian Syrian philosopher um, at the time. You know, there are a lot of Syrian Christians. His, his uncle is a, is a philosopher kind of guy. And his, his uncle is saying, hey, I kind of want to go see if we can establish some kind of relationship with India, kind of help bring more Christians over to India. I'm going to kind of do it. It really seems to me kind of like an expedition, not expedition, kind of like a discovery trip. But he's also just kind of looking for trade routes, cultural. It's just kind of, a, in some ways, it's almost a vacation. But there's, you know, a lot more going on to it than that. So he's going to India to visit for a while, maybe read books, talk to people, see if he can, what he can do. He's very involved at the church. And he asks for Mentius and his brother. He says, hey, do you guys want to come, you know, with me on this trip? And of course, like, if you're a kid in Syria and your dad's going all the way to, you know, so your uncle's going all the way to India, right? Like, you're not going to say no to this once in a lifetime opportunity. Sure, it's dangerous, but it sounds pretty great, right? That's something you're going to want to uh, want to be a part of. It's something you're going to want to do. And they go with him, and it goes very, very well. Uh, they get to India. They don't, you know, they don't shipwreck. No storm takes them out. No pirates land. Everything's great. 
uh, on their way back from India, they are making trips as they go. They're learning, they're studying, they've got books. It's been a wonderful time. And their very last port, pretty much before they head back into the uh, Roman provinces where Syria is, is going to be the stop off. And maybe it's not the last one. It's one of the, one of the last ones is the stop off in Axum. This is where everything goes completely south. And it, there's two versions. You know, in, in every story you will hear, there's going to be at least two versions. And in this version, one of them is that one of the sailors on this boat maybe got drunk and got mad and picked a fight with one of the people from Ethiopia. And this turned into a, just a giant brawl. And another version is they just said something that the Ethiopians didn't like and the Ethiopians were kind of already ready to go to kill some Romans. I don't know that that would be the case because Axum was completely a trading empire. And so like taking off Rome doesn't make a lot of sense. Something goes wrong and everybody on the boat is killed. Now, another version is that the two kids are spared because they're kids. But More Than Well is a Bible reading app that reads to you as you go. Their mission is inspired by the psalmist who encouraged us in Psalm 119 to hide the word of God in our hearts. Dwell was built to have the most beautiful listening and reading experience you can have for the scriptures. They have over a dozen recordings of the Bible, hand-picked voices that engage and inspire you. And they have the best versions of the Bible too. If you like the ESV, the KJV, the NLT, whatever version you enjoy listening to, there will be a voice reading it for you. For me, I like John of the NRSV. So often we are, you know, very busy and getting Bible reading time in and time to saturate yourself and your family with the Word of God can be a little bit difficult. This is another app that can help you do that between running around and listening to different episodes of Revive Thoughts or Mars Missionaries while you're waiting for the next one to come out. A great opportunity would be to put Dwell on maybe while you're in the car and let your children and yourself listen to that scripture and have that going as you go from place to place. You can also uh, have music on in the background that kind of plays between the different readings, and you can also pick a reading plan so you can go through the Bible at your own pace. Dwell has everything you would need, even a wake-up alarm that will kind of wake you up in the morning with it if that's something you would like to do. To get started with Dwell, go to dwellapp.io slash thoughts, or visit the link in the show notes. You'll get 10% off a yearly subscription or 30% off for Dwell for Life, never to pay again. 30% off means you save $60, so make sure to visit dwellapp.io slash thoughts and commit to scripture for the rest of this year or for life. Swing by JCPenney. The Black Friday in July deals are hot, hot, hot. Like $21.99 Arizona jeans and Home Expressions quick dry bath towels only $4.99. Get them while they last or check the JCP app for an extra 30% off coupon to use across the store. Buy online and pick up curbside to make life even easier. Shopping is back. JCPenney offers good on select styles through 724. Black Friday in July deals excluded from coupon. Conditions and exclusions apply. See store or jcp.com for details. Do it. Unlikely, at least the more traditional version, is that Frumentius and his brother were nearby, not on the boat, but were studying some books near a tree. And when they came back, oh my gosh, you know, everybody's dead, basically. They had been killed after this brawl broke out, including their uncle, and they didn't know what to do. Now, the Aksumites, the people there, kind of talk with them, realize these are two very educated children, like highly educated because their uncle is a philosopher and been teaching them. And so they bring them kind of to their leaders and their leadership say like, yeah, these are these are not your average uh, slave material. Like these are not people we're going to, you know, make work the farms. They need to go higher. And that these two boys ended up in front of the king of Ethiopia at the time. And the king of Ethiopia took a real liking to them and said, no, these are great. Uh, these are better than your average slaves. You're absolutely right. These are going to be my slaves. I'm going to put them in my palace. And that's kind of a sad story. I mean, obviously, right? They they were going home to Syria. They'll never see their homeland um, really ever again. They were going with their uncle. Their uncle is a great man. He's now dead. Everything they were planning to do in India is gone. And they now have to serve as slaves, the very king of the people who did this to them. That is a very sad story. It reminds me very much of Daniel, right, with Nebuchadnezzar, Mm -hmm. where his entire people are wiped out. and He's marched into the throne room of the man who did it, who's responsible. Very similarly... That's what happens to Fermentius. But if you're looking at it from a Christian perspective, and if you're kind of looking at it through the eyes of eternity, you've never had a better chance at seeing Ethiopia become Christian. You are now in the throne room of the king. And if the kings become Christian, the entire you know country will become Christian. 
And that's kind of the perspective for Mentius and his brother took of it. They said, hey, we're going to do our best. We're going to work as hard as we can. We're going to do an amazing job so that we can make it easier for the Christians living in Ethiopia. Because, you know, there are a couple out there here and there. And so they do a really good job. They impress the king. And over time, they start asking the king for things like, hey, are we, can we be allowed to worship freely? Um, and he granted it to them. And he said, hey, can we allow the merchants and the traders to come and, you know, enjoy church? Okay, you're allowed to do that too. You know, so they get some of the laws to change. And then suddenly, unexpectedly, a king who's not quite that old dies. And at that point, Frumentius and his brother are free from their obligations. They were slaves to the king. When the king dies, you're no longer his slave. And so they're like, okay, time to go, right? We're, we finished. Let's go back to Syria. Uh, what a weird time we've had here, right? Uh, but the queen comes to them and begs them and just says, please, please, please do not leave. The next king is my son. He's a baby. You know, this is going to, it's going to be so difficult for him to become the king. You two are so wise. You and your brother were like the king's favorite people. We would please raise my son and help him, uh, tutor him. And, you know, you make him, a, make him able to rule, leave when he's able to rule, but please stay because he needs you. Otherwise this whole thing will fall apart. And they agree. Again, the ferment is, he's like one years old and Fermentius and his brother agree to another 17 years of basically, you know, slavery. I'm sure they, it's not quite full slavery. It's definitely not, you know, ch chattel slavery, but it is still, you're, you're giving up that freedom to leave, serve the people who, you know, killed your uncle and stay. But they said, hey, Again, this is the best opportunity for Christians to get to Ethiopia. It's if we raise this king to like Christians, right? That would open the door for Christianity here in ways that has never been opened before. We had this rare opportunity. So they tutor him, they raise him, they get him till he's 18 or 20, and they say, okay, you know, we love you, king. We need to go uh, visit uh, our people. And we will, you know, you know, we'll see you. Thank you so much. And, you know, they had to leave. So they get him to adulthood. And Fermentius and his brother, they go over to, I believe it's Alexandria. And Alexandria at the time has a very famous Christian running, kind of running the show there called Athanasius. He is a real, um, he's a real big deal in the Christian world. He fights Arianism. Uh, the only reason we haven't done an episode on him in Revive Thoughts is because I've never found a sermon by him. Otherwise we would have. He's a really cool guy. Uh, and he loves Fermentius and his brother. And Fermentius and his brother come to him basically saying, give us, you know, missionaries need to go to Ethiopia. The king is open to it. We've never had a better shot. Let's do it. And Athanasius goes, you're right. And I've never met two people who speak the Ethiopian language, have access to the king and all this. You're the two people we're going to send as missionaries. Like, obviously, <laughs> you're the guys. You, there's no better people. Um, and, you know, they're like, well, we're not trained. So he trains them. So Athanasius trains these two gentlemen, Frumentius and his brother, gets them all ready to go and gives them a couple years of training and sends them back. And they go back to Ethiopia and they come back to the king. Uh, at the time when they were a slave, they lived with this Jewish guy. They convert him to Christianity. Again, another Jewish person in Ethiopia already. And then they, uh, they get in there, they convert the king, they convert the king's brother. And eventually uh, th they have converted Ethiopia, not fully, but they've converted the name, you know, status. The, the, if you were to look at the official religion of Ethiopia, because you've converted the royal family, you've converted Ethiopia to a Christian country. And they spend the rest of their lives serving there. And by the end of it, they're actually sending, Ethiopia sending small groups of missionaries to other parts of Africa. So they've done such a successful job. They've managed to, you know, get it Christian enough that they're sending Christians out as well. All of this because of Fermentius and his brother basically, at a very young age, choosing to sacrifice their life and their needs for the cause of Christ in Ethiopia. Which is, if you knew nothing else, that is an amazing story and a wonderful thing that has happened so, here in Ethiopia. So did uh, the, the previous references about uh, you know a church existing there prior to this is that still around or is that died out or is there just there just happens to be other believers in the area you know it clearly doesn't seem to be a part of the the royal family or the the higher um uh yeah. people there but so it, there, there were some christians but there's no bishop and like to us as evangelicals we're gonna go okay and um <laughs> but to them and the 300s that basically meant the church wasn't there there's nobody okay. ordained there's nobody you know leading mass or whatever there's none of those kind of community things happening and they're not being no one from ethiopia up until this point is being invited to like the different councils right but they're like the big councils the big things going on uh aren't happening now some people have mistakenly said that Ethiopia was the first 
kingdom to become Christian, that would be Armenia, and then followed quickly by Rome, and then Ethiopia comes right there in third. But it, the good news is, yay, Ethiopia's made it, right? They're Christian. The bad news is uh, this really only happened in the capital. And yes, the capital was kind of at least nominally Christian for 100 years or so, but they weren't really truly Christian uh, and you wouldn't, the average person would have still been pagan as soon as you left the capital, like out in the tribes, everything was different. And that doesn't really start to change until about a hundred years later. Now, another controversy with the church of Ethiopia. I, and this is a real, I, mean, I talked to people about what I, this episode I was working on. Some people would say like, well, isn't the church of Ethiopia not even really Christian? Aren't they Nestorian if you're a theological person? Uh, or aren't those people basically not orthodox? They don't believe in the same things we do. And they would write off the Church of Ethiopia. And they kind of were like, Troy, why are you spending all this time on a church that isn't even a part of our church? And the reason for this is because of this next part. Now, I have thought about how to teach this next part a lot <laughs> because it is difficult. I'm going to go through it the best I can. And Joel, you're going to ask all the clarifying questions you uh -huh. can. Uh, I do not think I can do this perfectly. And if this turns you off and you go, I don't think they're saved because of this, okay. You know, let's, that's, then that is fine. You're going to hear about a church, a group of people claiming to be Christian that you don't believe are Christian. I will say that that puts you out of step with the Catholic Church, the Reformers, the Lutherans, and a lot of other people throughout church history to say that these are not Christians because of this. This, but this, it, it, you know, there are, I have, again, there are people I was, that I have said, that I just don't think they are Christians because of their, their view of an impossible subject. So if you are, Joel and I, you have heard of the Chalcedonian Council or the hypostatic union, right, Joel, in which, which is, what is that saying? What is going on with that? God is a hundred percent man and a hundred percent God. Yes. Both, both embodiment at the same time. Okay. So that is the Chalcedonian Council. It's 451, uh, you know, AD, everyone comes together. Originally, the biggest council was like the Nicene one, right? Where the Nicene Creed gets kind of written and all that stuff. And that happens in the early 300s. And then there are these series of councils that happen after that. And people are trying to figure out how to view God, right? And Ethiopia, by the way, is considered right along with the rest of the churches. In fact, the churches haven't divided yet. Um, they're considered one big body of churches until around the year 431. But uh, the Aryans get kicked out with the you know Nicene Creed, and nobody considers them Christians, so that's fine. Um, but they're sent out, and you know, very early on, and then around the year 431, there's this break because a man named you know Nestorius has this kind of idea that there are two natures to God. There's a God nature, and there's a man nature. And that these are two separate kind of divided things. And the Council of Ephesus goes and 431 goes, if you believe, you know, if you're following Nestor, get out of here because we don't want that because God is not some divided thing with two things going on. And if you're having trouble following, I, I will, here, let me pull up that because I'm just going to read the, the, the Wikipedia version of this because it's about the easiest way I can explain it. Mm -hmm. I always try to find like the easiest version. Yeah, because that's not, I mean, that's not what we were taught in Bible college. There was, there. I mean, no. yeah, the, the the Nicene Creed of God embodying 100% man and 100% God at the same time simultaneously doesn't make sense you know, physically, but uh, yeah. supernaturally, you know, God exists outside of our rules, outside of our dimensions. Yeah, where basically there's two natures. This is the way that the historians say it. There's a divine God and a human, and it's almost like there are two spirits shoved inside of one person. One is God, one is man, and these two are like talking to each other almost, right? And we hear that, and if you're, you know, if you're not a uh, historian, you're going, that sounds kind of not right. That's right. That's not the way we're supposed to view God. You're supposed to view him as 100% man, 100% God, and those are things are fully united. And this idea of them being almost like two separate people inside the same body is not how you're supposed to view it. And so in 431, they kicked Nestorius out, and they said, no, one nature, that God took on flesh, but it's 100% God, 100% man, and it's one nature. Now, if you're hearing that, you're going to go, wait a second, but the Chalcedonian Council, 100% man, 100% God, two natures united in one. You're correct. That comes 20 years later. And so for 20 years, the church position was what is called monophysites, which is, or monophysite or meophysite, which is how the Ethiopians prefer to call it, which is that God is 100% man, 100% God. It's one nature, fully united, but not two natures. 
And in the year 451, they changed it because they were dealing with some other heresies at the time. And the hypostatic union, as we call it, this Chalcedonian council comes out and says, God's 100% man, 100% God, two natures united in this one thing, right? And the Ethiopians, the Syrians, and some of these other people said, no, we're not okay with that. Didn't we just kick Nestorius out for saying there are two natures just 20 years ago? No. They said, Chalcedonian, you guys have gone way too far. You sound like the Nestorians that we fought 20 years ago. And so several of the churches left at this time. Now, this creates this huge issue because and it's very complicated. But when the Nestorians got kicked out in 431, I'm really summarizing this, by the way. When the Nestorians got kicked out in 431, they left the Roman world and they left the Ethiopian world and they went over to Persia, where the Persians kind of let them in. That's why, if you've heard of the Church of the Far East, they're oftentimes called Nestorian. We might have to do an episode on the Church of the Far East because that's not quite really right either. One part of them were Nestorian, but not all of them were Nestorian. And Nestorian changed over time, and even they got their own theologians who read men like St. Augustine and kind of translated them. They're their own thing. This is just as complicated in the Church of the Far East as it is in Ethiopia. This other group of people, the Armenians, the Syrians, the Ethiopians, this kind of group that left that will become the Coptic Church, they said, we don't agree with the Chalcedonian. That sounds too much like the Nestorians we fought before. We think that God and humanity was perfectly bound, one, one nature, that the, that the Logos became flesh perfectly. If I can read it to you, and I'm just reading to you like the, uh, the, uh, the Wikipedia, Wikipedia version. Yeah. This is like, this, this, not because like I used Wikipedia to understand this, although I'm gonna lie if I said it wasn't kind of helpful, um, but also because this is kind of like the simplified-ish version of how we can understand what's going on here. So here's kind of a quote, a much later quote describing it, where they said, basically, they believe in one nature of the incarnating Logos taking on the flesh. (sighs) And if you're like me, you might be listening to this and going, okay, what, like, what are, like, what are we even talking about? This just sounds like you're having a semantical battle. Like you're just battling over words for the sake of battling over words. Some people are going to hear this and go, I don't like the Church of Ethiopia because I really think we need to stick with the Chalcedonian version. Look, I am with you. I I also am a hypostatic union guy. I want 100% man, 100% God, two natures united in one. But would I be willing to kick somebody out of my church? Or would I be willing to say that the church down the street is not a Christian church because they believed that no, that God and man were one nature, not two. Is that enough to kick them out? A lot of times we confuse battles with Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons or with the Church of Ethiopia today, which is very different than the early Church of Ethiopia, just like the early Roman Church is very different than the Church of the Vatican of the 1500s, right? We, we confuse these battles and we go, no, we must be exact in our terminology. But one thing we have to remember too is A, they were not fighting in the same language. The Ethiopians weren't Latin speakers. They knew Latin to trade, but they spoke Syrian and Ethiopian. They had their own languages. The Latin speaking churches are over here saying it has to be two natures. And the Syrian and Ethiopian speaking churches are going, I don't understand what you're doing. It sounds like you become Nestorians. How much did that language difference and barrier cause a problem? The other thing, too, is these churches are also having a battle over politics. One of the one part of the world is saying they want the church center of the world to be Alexandria. Another one is saying they want it to be Rome. And another one is saying they want it to be Antioch or Constantinople or, you know, whatever. And it's not Constantinople yet, but you know what I'm saying? Like, there's this kind of battle. Ha- I guess it was at that point. But there's this battle happening of where the church's center is going to be. And the Syrian and Armenian and Ethiopian will become the Coptic churches saying, we want to align behind Alexandria. And they're over here saying, no, we want to align behind this. This stuff is all playing into this. We love these councils to be purely theological councils, but they aren't. There's politics, there's language barriers, there's stuff going on that is beyond just the pure theology of what they are saying. And part of the reason these churches left and part of the reason these churches were kicked out was this idea that, like, you're not getting on board with where the capital of Christianity is going to be. And it's not going to be in Alexandria anymore. It's going to be over here in the Middle East. How much did these things all play into each other? I don't know. Now, again, I said, okay. So did did the... Ethiopian church split off at that point or, or get kicked out at that point or yeah or so what this was the this 451 Chalcedonian council where the where the churches of what you know of, of Africa and uh you know Egypt and Armenia and Syria they kind of go like hey you're 
you're sounding Nestorian, we have to leave. And so they leave and they form their own kind of bishopric thing. But the thing is, for a while, the Catholic Church, like as, as we kind of know, it, is still sending them bishops. Like they're still working together. And about a hundred years later, they actually patch things up. And like the Church of Alexandria will stay in contact with the Church of Rome for hundreds and hundreds of years later. So we, and there again, I talked to people who are like, they're not Christian because of this. And I was like, but the Catholic Church didn't even see them that way. They viewed them as Christian the whole way through. In fact, in the 1400s, they'll try to reabsorb them back into the Catholic Church again. So they never really kicked them fully out, but they end up on their own as a part of the Coptic church system, which is like adjacent. And if you've ever heard people say like the church was united until Martin Luther, no, it wasn't. The Coptic church was over here. The church of the Far East was doing its thing. Eventually you have the Orthodox Greek church and the Orthodox Russian church. The church has never been truly united under one umbrella. After the first like 30 to 50 years, churches started to have these divisions. They're not new and it didn't start with Martin Luther. They've been around for a very long time. Could you could you kind of just in a really oversimplified way just once again uh, indicate what the differences between the, the conflicting viewpoints are, right? I, I think we, yeah. or most people, understand the the traditional view that we see it now as, as God being 100% man and 100% God at the same time, having these two different uh, instances of existence existing yeah. simultaneously— and you're saying that the Ethiopian church was saying this instead? What were you, what is yeah, it? Yeah, so, and I, I hear you. It's really hard to, yes, they're saying the exact same thing that God, okay. that, that Jesus Christ is 100% man, 100% God, but instead of saying, like, he's two natures, he's both 100% man and 100% God, they're saying it's all one. Like, he's 100% man and God at the same time, and it's one mm. nature. And if you're having trouble understanding why, that's, worth breaking the churches apart over i'm with you i don't mm -hmm. fully understand how this caused like five different countries worth of churches to split from the rest of the churches i do i mean there are certain passages in the bible that i feel like that would cause complications over trying to explain and i do think that theology would add to some it, it'd be really hard to explain certain passages in in the bible as far as god's nature and so i i guess i i could see it being a hindrance towards especially if you're trying to build a church structure do i guess well and what's strange though is that in 431 all of the churches agreed that though god is 100 percent man 100 percent god it was one nature and in 451 20 years later they changed it and that was when the churches said hey you're becoming a story and we can't go with you so again mm -hmm. Ethio in a lot of ways it wasn't that Rome kicked them out. It was that Ethiopia and them said, we don't want to be with you. You're the Nestorians now. You're the ones making God too when he's really still one. We see him as 100% man, 100% God, but as one. What are you doing making him two where he's one? That's what we all agreed on 20 years ago. The other thing that's crazy too is the Nestorians also thought that Chalcedon was backing them up. In Persia, they looked over and they said, see, we told you he's two. Thank you, Chalcedon. And they actually started killing the Christians that wouldn't agree with them in Persia, persecuting them and kicking them out. And the churches of Armenia and Syria and Ethiopia and all these people had to write letters to them basically being like, hey, Persian churches, you know, Nestorians, stop using Chalcedon against us. We'll quit trading with you. You can't persecute our people. And so it was such a Nestorian sounding thing that the Nestorians also thought it was backing their point up. So again, Chalcedon, this whole, th and again, there's politics and there's language and there's semantics and there's culture and there's history and there's barriers here that are hard to explain that I think there was more going on than just this, but it, Chalcedon did not, if the idea was unite against this new heresy, I don't think it went over the way it was supposed to. And this is someone who completely agrees with the council that God is 100% man, 100%. I would say the two natures is where I land. But how can you perfectly describe God as 100% man and God anyway, right? Like when, um, when you read Millard Erickson's book, Systematic Theology, he says something to the effect of like, look, you know, there was a student who was afraid to write any description of the Trinity on paper. And he said, if I write anything, or maybe it was actually this 100% man, 100% guy, he said, if I write anything, I'm going to fall into Apollinarianism or Anestinarianism or this and that and the other. I'm scared to write anything because no matter what I write, I'm going to fall into a heresy trying to explain in human words the fact that God was man and God was also God. I, I just don't know how to do it. And Erickson was kind of like, I get that. And I feel like that's what happened here. We as humans are trying to put a divine miracle 
which is God becoming humanity into human words and systematic terms mm-hmm. that we can understand. And the human language, as much as we can get close, will, I think, always fail to perfectly capture this divine mystery. And so using different languages and different terms in the early days of the church, I could see how you would be almost saying the identical thing, and that would be enough to make it sound like you're saying something different. I totally agree on heresies being heresies. I just don't know that this was one of those cases that that was actually supposed to happen. So the good news for the Church of Ethiopia is as all these people are leaving or being kicked out of Rome uh, in the Roman Catholic world, they come to Ethiopia. And so there's these nine people who come to Ethiopia called the Nine Saints. These guys kind of come in and they start building churches, building monasteries, and they bring in the rest of Ethiopia. And Ethiopia is no longer just the capital saved. The whole country is saved after the nine saints kind of come in, each bringing monasteries. They do some really cool things too. The very first, if you ever think of like a medieval Bible, you think of like these, you know, old texts like on paper and you'll see like these pictures maybe in your head. That started in Ethiopia when these nine saints started doing that. So they had some important roles that played. And again, the whole world kind of read each other a little bit more than we give them credit for. The medieval church and each other, were they were a little bit aware of each other at this time. Over time, the Catholic Church does repair things up with the Coptic Church, and for a while, they do get along. Ethiopia is receiving bishops from Alexandria over on the Egyptian side. They're considered a Coptic Church, a part of like the church network under Egypt. They get their bishops and their priests from Egypt. Ethiopia is thriving. During this time, Ethiopia is also kind of moving out of the Middle East. Um, this will be the most powerful they ever are. The 500s and 600s is like their apex. They are like a fighting, dominating trade empire. They rule their neighbors. Things are going well. But then in the 700s, 800s, things start to kind of slide. They eventually lose the Middle Eastern side, and eventually they even lose their access to the sea, which is not good for the trading empire that is Ethiopia. And in the 700s and 800s, they kind of had their uh, big, you know, declining point. Now, it's pretty obvious why, but Joel, why did Ethiopia have a giant decline in the 700s and 800s? If you know your world history, this is pretty easy. Yes, it was clearly because (laughs) of... Of the earthquakes. No, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. What is it? Islam. So Islam starts existing in the 600s and 700s, and it spreads over the Middle East like wildfire, and it takes over everything, and these Muslim kingdoms start you know, attacking and invading and growing, and Ethiopia is right there in the middle of all that, and so they start taking some of the lands from the Ethiopians. Now, to be fair to the Islamic, early Islamic days they actually did not attack the ethiopians in fact muhammad said leave the ethiopians alone because in his very early days when he was running from some of the persecutors around him he hid in ethiopia and ethiopia was very tolerant of other religions and allowed muhammad to kind of find safe refuge there so when he got bigger there was kind of an unspoken rule don't attack ethiopians because they you know they're not they're christians they're not us but they helped us out But after a while, that rule kind of goes away, and they start taking the lands from the Christian kingdom. Uh, And as Islam spreads, it starts kind of attacking Constantinople, takes over, you know, good Egypt is kind of run by Islam. Eventually, there's one little lone Christian kingdom in the middle of Africa, surrounded by Islam and pagan. Pagans on the south, and Islam to the north and the east of it. Eventually, Ethiopia is kind of on her own. She's still kind of in contact with the Byzantine Empire. She's still kind of in contact with Europe. But in a lot of ways, she is kind of cut off from the world. And this is the story, really, of Ethiopia. She is this kingdom in Africa, living by herself. And she has to go through a lot of the same things that the rest of the churches of the world go through, but constantly surrounded on all sides by hungry predators ready to just destroy her limb from limb. As rough as it was to be a Christian in certain parts of the world, I think the Ethiopian story, and one of the reasons we don't know it is because it was hard to write down. And one of the reasons we don't know it is because Ethiopia was so surrounded by wolves her entire life that she never really got a chance to share what happened to her. Even today, Ethiopia is still surrounded by a lot of not very friendly countries in that area, but it was even worse back then. And the countries of Europe, they could kind of lean on each other. When Constantinople needed help, the First Crusade happened, right? They reached out to Europe, and Europe was able to send people. There was trading and pressure point things they could do. You know, the Muslims couldn't take all of Spain, or couldn't they could, but they couldn't take France because, you know, then they might lose trade with Italy. Things like that could occur. Ethiopia didn't really have any of those strings to push 
or pool because if you took her out, like there's no one coming to help her. There is no, if you hurt our people in Ethiopia, this will happen. In fact, Ethiopia will end up threatening a lot more people uh, in that way than others will. And so Ethiopia is poised and situated in this very unique circumstance where she spends <clears throat> the next 1,500 years or 1,300 years or whatever it is completely surrounded by enemies. And on, on almost two different occasions, she should have been just, I mean, actually way more than two, several different occasions, she should have been wiped off the map. And yet <clears throat> she holds on and survives against really all odds. That ends up being what happens here. And it it really is actually quite incredible that the Ethiopia even exists when you look at this whole story. Awesome. I think that is a great end of part one. What what's what's ahead of the the path for Ethiopia? What is there in a part two to talk about? Oh man, I wish we could have spent more time on this story in some ways instead of going over the theological terms. It's not really my favorite because I really want to tell you about a woman named Queen Judith who single-handedly pretty much destroys Axum, uh, just hatefully, mind you. Uh, she might have been the a former prostitute who was sent off and comes back with an army and destroys everything. That's at least one version of the legend, and I really want to tell you her story because it's crazy. Then we tell the story of Ande the Conqueror with a name like the Conqueror. You know, he must have done some crazy, some stuff. He literally reforges Ethiopia and makes it an unconquerable kingdom in the middle of the 1300s. And that is the moment that opens the door to us getting to that original question. Even before what happened to the Ethiopian eunuch, did the church steal the Reformation? Or was the Reformation started in Ethiopia? We will answer that question. We will answer more about the Solomon bloodline. We will get into some more details of some of these other things. And you will find out about a man, an incredible man named Estefanos, who leads a very incredible Reformation-like moment. And you will also find out why I can tell you with pretty good certainty whether or not the Reformation stole his idea or not. Uh, you'll get all of that, and then you will find out what happened to the rest of the time in Ethiopia, and where did they go from there? Some pretty incredible stories. And a war that happens in the 1800s that is called the most expensive, basically, waste of time that ever occurred in war history on all sides. Uh, that Elise actually talked about just a hair in one of her recent Martyrs and Missionaries. So it is a very interesting story. Um, I, I, I hope you are a little bit interested in where this is going because, hmm. well, trust me, the best stories are definitely to come. We covered the basics of how we got to Christian the setup. Axum. Yeah. Now let me tell you what happens to how Christian Axum gets destroyed and then rebuilt, becomes one of the most powerful kingdoms of Africa, and then has its Reformation Martin Luther moment. Swing by JCPenney. The Black Friday and July deals are hot, hot, hot. Like $21.99 Arizona jeans and Home Expressions quick dry bath towels only $4.99. Get them while they last or check the JCP app for an extra 30% off coupon to use across the store. Buy online and pick up curbside to make life even easier. Shopping is back. JCPenney. Offers good on select styles through 724. Black Friday and July deals excluded from coupon. Conditions and exclusion supply. See store or jcp.com for details. Do it.